We had a retreat last month for the wise humanity community in the Atlas Mountains of Morocco. It was 40 people for four days, and the togetherness of it was so nourishing that it made me start thinking again about the pandemic and the isolation that many of us went through during the first part of it especially, and how we are processing that, learning from it, and recovering from it. I personally thought that I would be fine with being alone during the lockdown in New York City. I've always been a bit of an introvert. I love just being alone with a book. I have a yoga practice and a meditation practice, so I thought I'd be fine. And I was fine for the first few months, and and then months turned into years, and habits that I developed in the isolation part sort of were self-perpetuating. So for example, I made my work fully remote, and then it stayed remote. It felt convenient and easy to do that. And relationships that were interrupted during the pandemic didn't necessarily restart themselves. And things that I found relaxing and convenient, like watching a movie by myself, still kept going even though I could have organized outings with friends. So my brain was telling me that these habits were relaxing and convenient, but actually my body was starting to tell me otherwise. I started to feel bodily anxiety and a kind of dysregulated feeling. And I was wondering what it was when I just happened to be reading about just this kind of thing in a couple of neuroscience books, and I want to share with you what I learned. So the first book that I read was called Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain by Lisa Feldman Barrett. And she describes that, well, first she, she explains that our brain's main function is not thinking. Our brain's main function is regulating our body and our body chemistry. So it makes sure our heart is beating at the right, at the right rate and our lungs are breathing and our digestion's working and our hormones are responding appropriately and all the electrical signals and all the chemical reactions, that are, they're all more or less coordinated by the brain. So that's the brain's main job, but the brain does this job largely by taking input from outside the body and especially from relationships. So the relationships that we have help the brain regulate the body. For example, if someone raises an eyebrow at you, your brain releases chemicals in your body in reaction. Or if someone hugs you, your brain releases different chemicals in your body. It's almost like we co-regulate our bodies through our personal relationships. And these effects are measurable. When you spend a lot of time with someone, you sometimes synchronize your breathing with them or your heartbeat synchronize. And this happens not just in intimate relationships, but also with neighbors and friends and in yoga classes or choir practice. Women who spend a lot of time together synchronize their menstrual cycles. It's almost like we're in this invisible dance together. It reminds me of the way we recently found out that trees actually invisibly communicate and support each other through their root systems. People also invisibly communicate and support each other. And this explains why loneliness and isolation are such a problem. Loneliness has been an epidemic in our society for decades, even before the pandemic. There was a Cigna study that showed that over half of Americans, 54% of Americans said that nobody really knew them well and that they hadn't had a substantial conversation with anybody for weeks. In Britain, half of the people over 65 said that their main companionship came from the television or a pet. And loneliness is not just prevalent among older people, also younger people. So for example, in Japan, over half a million people reported that they hadn't left their apartment or spoken with anyone for over six months, and this is before the pandemic. And loneliness is on the rise among children and among new parents as well. And the damage that loneliness causes is significant and measurable as well. It significantly increases our risk of heart attack, stroke, and dementia, and also early death. This finding correlates with the famous Harvard study that you might have heard of. It's the longest longitudinal study of 
well-being, and longevity that's ever been carried out. The scientists followed the same group for decades. They measured all kinds of factors that you would expect would contribute to well-being and longevity, such as eating habits, exercise, wealth, race, um, genes, IQ. And the one thing they found that really increased well-being and longevity was strong social relationships. The study of how relationships affect our brains has spawned a new field called relational neurobiology. These neuroscientists argue that our relationships and our mind create neural pathways in our brains. One of the scientists, his name is Dan Siegel, and he wrote a book called The Neurobiology of We. He concentrates on the examples of infants and how they bond with their caregivers. Research has shown that infants need more than just food and shelter to survive. They need an actual relationship with a caregiver. And hugging is not enough. They need something much more complex and human than that. They need, infants need to have the experience of expressing a need, having it understood and responded to. So it's quite complex and it's crucial for an infant's brain development. If they don't get that kind of caregiving, they fail to thrive and they can even die. So that's an example of how relationships actually create our brains. It's kind of like the, the African concept of Ubuntu, that a person is a person through other persons. So basically we couldn't exist except in this human relationship network. So no wonder my body felt dysregulated after being isolated for so long. And no wonder that the feeling of nourishment at the Wise Humanity Retreat was so profound. We spent a lot of time talking, we shared our life stories, we did yoga together, took walks and hikes, we went swimming, we did yoga and breath work and even qigong. And friends who hadn't seen each other for years finally got to hug each other again and console each other over their losses during the pandemic. It felt like we were washing off the isolation's effects in a bath of trust and empathy and connection, a love bath. So that's what I've learned about recovering from the isolation of the pandemic. Even though I'm still living alone and I'm still working remotely, I've decided to take an in-person love bath as a non-negotiable part of each week. It can be a walk and talk with a friend or a meal or a book club. I understand now that even though I'm an introvert, having a weekly quality time with friends and family is an absolute must. 